Welcome to our first Ecos Lab conference. We are very happy to be here talking uh, about early music and its influence in the early music se sector and the environment. We have four speakers today. The first one is Albert Edelman, is the president of the REMA, the European Network of Early Music and artistic coordinator of the Concert Gebau Rouge. We have Giulio Prandi, director of the Coro and Orchestra Gislieri and vice president of REMA. We have here Raquel Andueza, president of GEMA, the Association of Early Music Groups and artistic director of the Estella Early Music Week. Estella Early Music Week. And we have Richard Heeson, director of St. John's Smith Square and the London Festival of Baroque Music and also vice president of REMA. Thank you for being here. And we also have four ensembles today. They will interact afterwards. We have As Humana, Preterito Imperfecto, Ibera Auri, and Serendipia Ensemble. Um, the first question will be answered in first uh, by Albert Edelman, and we will, I will ask you to introduce yourself, your institution, and the interest of your institution uh, and the relation with the topic of today, which is how can early music and early music ensemble be relevant to the festivals where it performs, the cities it visits, its country of origin, create value around our project through interactions with other sect sectors, institutional relations, and international collaboration. So, Albert Edelman, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jorge. It's very nice to be here in this very REMA heavy session, of course. Uh, it's lovely to see Gema as well. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to be able to, to present a little bit of what REMA does, but maybe for those who don't know the Concertgebouw in Bruges, um, we're a normal concert hall, shall we say. We have a full season of all things ranging from early music to contemporary dance and uh, everything we could think of to put in, in between. And as such, I would say that early music in Bruges is uh, together with partners like the Ma Festival and we have a period orchestra working in the city. Um, early music is quite alive and people in the audience and in the city know what it is to deal with um, historical instruments, to work with sources, to, to create programs that engage the audience in, uh, in the story of early music. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been wonderful for me to work here in Bruges after first starting in the Utrecht Festival, which I think most of you know um, from performing or attending. And uh, it's um, one of the larger events in the world dealing with early music. Um, I really got the bug there to, uh, to, to continue working on this, this wonderful repertoire and this way of, way of dealing with things. And um, yeah, I've taken that to, to Bruges and found a very fertile ground to, um, to work on it further. Belgium is a really extraordinary place to be working with early music. There's so much happening. There's so much interest. There's a, a real platform. So it's, um, it's a good place to to engage as many um, aspects and sectors and people with uh, with what we do. I think does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, thank you very um, Albert. And uh, now we will listen to Giulio Prandi. I'm sorry, Giulio. We cannot listen to you. Maybe you can open your microphone. I, yeah, you know, my, also my last Zoom meeting was some weeks ago, so I forgot some of the, you know, features of the program. So, hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here too, and uh, of course I would have preferred to be actually there as we were supposed to be, but, you know, you never know, we do it another time. Uh, well, my name is Giulio Brandi, I'm a musician, and I'm an artistic director of the Early Music Center at the uh, Found Gisleri Foundation in Pavia which is a university foundation. So we basically work on research, performance, and uh, education, because in Italy, actually, we are still developing a, a, a wider interest in early music. Our public is still um, more on opera and some 
symphonic music and also uh, chamber music is not going very well in our place. So it's really about building an interest, but Pavia is a fantastic place uh, to do that because we have uh, 70,000 uh, inhabitants and 25,000 students, which means we have also you know, 10,000 people working in university. We have a fantastic musicology department, but it is in Cremona because uh, it was set there because of the instrument building tradition, but uh, we are working more and more together. So there is a lot of young people coming from abroad and whole Italy uh, and staying for a period of four or five years, which gives us a privileged place to, you know, uh, spread the interest, that, to spread the interest to people that also will go away and hopefully, you know, spread it elsewhere. Uh, what do we do to do that? Well, of course, we have our orchestra and choir, with which we do a lot of research, but this is more about uh, performance. Uh, the main things we do is a series of concerts in our, in our hall, but also in different places in the town, uh, more traditional, but also uh, in the outskirts, so trying to join uh, directly people that normally don't go to concerts. And we do uh, education, which means that we do, uh, we, we make people meet directly the artists. We have a university choir uh, with a broad participation. We teach them vocal technique. We make them interact with our emerging ensembles. We did a fantastic project with Cantoria with them. They, uh, they shared their repertoire with our students and it was both fun and very, very uh, beautiful artistically. So in our place, it's really about putting in ballo what we have in, uh, in Italy about early music, but also uh, involving people and spreading interest. Uh, so we don't have very big concerts. Uh, we can't afford to have uh, big orchestras and big soloists as guests, but we always focus on programs that can, uh, you know, uh, interest people in, in this kind of music. And more than that, in the general frame that music is a part of a cultural heritage. It's not just, a, not, just some, not just something fun and, of course it is, but not just something fun and good to hear for a nice evening out, but it's really a part of our genome as, as, as human beings. So this is what we try to do in Pavia. And uh, I have to say that I was incredibly happy of this ECHOS idea because connection uh, throughout Europe and throughout generations and throughout different jobs, programmers, uh, organizers, artists, etc., is of the biggest importance to achieve this goal. Thank you, Giulio. Uh, now is the turn of Raquel. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Raquel Andueza. I'm a soprano, and uh, I was a normal, regular soprano until. Um, I decided to, to take the lead of um, GEMA Association, the Aso Spanish Association of Early Music Groups, uh, because I think now, now, especially now, we are in a very difficult moment and we, have, we already had things to solve and things to establish because we, you know, luckily we have uh, many, many early music ensembles in Spain, which are really good, which are developing and growing. Um, full of young people who are willing to play, to sing this repertoire in a very good way. And um, also uh, very like um, elder groups, which form a part of the association as well. And um, it's a challenge to represent all of them, but I think now it's, um, it's a very good moment now to, you know, with all this crisis also to think and to reestablish the roots and you know all the bad things that are really um, um, patent is how to say it, really uh, on the surface now after all this crisis they, you know they just uh, went to the surface and I think it's, it's a good thing to we have to take this opportunity as a challenge to to change things from the roots and also uh, during this um, confinement, I became the artistic director of the Stella Music Festival. So it's been also a challenge to program um, this wonderful festival, which is very old, it's 50 years, 51 years old, which is for an early music festival in Spain. It's like a, it's like a miracle. 
it was created by, by a group of um, as a, an association of uh, friends of the Camino de Santiago. So it's, it's really something really amazing that uh, after 51 years, the festival is still on. And it's something very important. Estella is a town, a very small town of uh, 40,000 inhabitants, but um, uh, 14, sorry, 14,000 inhabitants. Um, so the, but all the region, Navarra, um, is, uh, is a very musical region. So uh, it's, be, it's really a part of our her musical heritage. And of course, the challenge of this year is to, to keep this uh, festival, even if uh, all the concerts have been canceled, but apparently the festival is going to be running. And also, as uh, Julio was saying, to interact with the, with the village to show, you know, we are using the spaces of the town. We have to use them more as explore different um, possibilities of concerts, not only the churches, and um, also to attract all different people from different ages and uh, social uh, approaches, because I think it's very important that music has to arrive to all of us. It's not a luxury, it's, a, it's something that we really need. Thank you very much, Raquel. And now I will ask Richard to present himself. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here today. I'd like Julio, I wish we were with you in person, but that will be another year. Um, so I uh, manage St. John Smith Square, which is a concert hall in central London, but we're actually also, we're, we are a converted Baroque church. So we're from 1728, we were built so, um, the music we we hear in the in the concert hall, uh, obviously when we're playing music from uh, the 17th and 18th century, it's very relevant to the setting. I also uh, am the director of the London Festival of Baroque Music, which happens every year in May, and is a particular focus within our program. Similar to Albert in Bruges, our concert hall is a concert hall that presents a wide uh, variety of concerts across the year um, and over 300 concerts throughout the course of the year. But early music is a particular focus, actually particularly Baroque music because of the heritage of the building. I suppose um, where it's interesting for me is that I'm in the middle of a very big major metropolitan city. Um, and despite perhaps some of the political um, sides of this country at the moment. We are still a center of music um, and international center with four conservatoires, two opera houses, many symphony orchestras and chamber orchestras, um, many uh, festivals and other such organizations. Um, and so what I'm very keen to do with St. John Smith Square is to look at what we can create that is distinctive and marks us out within this, this huge sort of um, uh, 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 amount of things that are going on. And what we can do is reflect this sector, the early music sector, um, and be, provide something of a hub within London for um, this side of, uh, of music making and, and activity and aesthetic, which perhaps isn't reflected in some of the bigger, uh, more, um, broad organizations. So that's really where, where we sit and what we try to do. Thank you, Richard. Um, and this meeting, this Echos Lab, this first Echos Lab was, be, was supposed to be done in Sierra Espuña, uh, live in, in, with the presence of the, the REMA board, thanks to the organization of Acción Cultural Española, with the collaboration of the University of Murcia and the six councils of Sierra Espuña. Uh, but they cannot be here because of the obvious uh, confinement reasons. We also, I, I want to send uh, the best thoughts to Totana and Aledo, which are now in a very, very hard situation, um, but we are all sure that we will uh, be better very soon. I will, use, I, I will ask Albert Edelman to use one minute just to present REMA to those who don't know what REMA is. Yeah, I should have done that earlier, shouldn't I? Um, so REMA is um, the European Early Music Network, founded 20 years ago um, to 
basically get together organizers, festivals, concert halls, uh, series throughout the year, who deal mostly with early music. So we have around, uh, well, almost 100 members now from all across Europe. Um, we are slowly filling in the gaps uh, where we do not have enough members. Uh, Spain and Portugal are, are cre creeping up closer and closer. I'm happy that uh, you are a new member, of course, and there's a, there's a few colleagues in the, in the general area as well. Um, and what we've been doing for the past 20 years is basically meet, um, discover the way we can run our festivals, which ranges widely often, um, discover uh, new ensembles, old ensembles, ways of presenting things, and um, engaging everybody who's dealing with early music basically in, in, in our business, uh, because early music especially is um, is a very connected way of, uh, of dealing with heritage. There is the research, there is the instruments, there is um, people dealing with sources, additions. Uh, CDs, of course, have become extremely important. There's a huge power base in uh, of the hands of a few people who decide who gets to make a CD. Um, getting all these people at the table is, uh, is I think, the ultimate goal of uh, REMA to, um, to represent the whole ecosystem of, uh, of what we do, because it's, um, it's, it's very worth it. And you can feel it also in the, uh, the legacy members, shall we say, as well as the new members in REMA. It's a very dynamic, dynamic bunch. So uh, we're, looking, we're looking forward to a future where we can meet, where concerts can have an audience, where we can see each other. But in the meantime, we are, um, we're here and we're, we're very happy and uh, we hope we can be as relevant as possible as a, as a network. Thank you very much, Albert. Uh, we will now hear your answers to the first question, which will uh, be Julia Brandi, the first speaker, to speak about what role should the early music sector play in relation to local, national and international politics? Well, I think I, I, I already started to answer to that question before. Uh, of course, it's a difficult one because what is early music actually? Early music started uh, because some people uh, started to question about uh, the way they played and sang the music. So it was really a personal research um, and, um, and it was about early music because they focused on, on a repertoire. But then some decades after, uh, it's, it's really about, not about the repertoire, but about the method, about, uh, about a constant research about aesthetics, history, uh, the way we deal with these aesthetics, how we, how, we, um, how we present it today, how we can make this music speak, and ultimately, how can early music be, how can music be a part of a broader uh, frame, which is culture in general, which is our being humans, which is our, our, our way of feeling things and dealing with the world. I know this can, be, this can sound a bit dizzy, but it really isn't, because uh, you will, of course, need opera houses and symphonic orchestras presenting uh, in a fantastic way um, repertoire every day, because this is also a part of our society now, of course, uh, and, and we all enjoy a Wiener Philharmonica concert, but we also need to, um, to, to remember that uh, art is, has to be perceived as, as what it is, as, as something which is at the heart of our, uh, of our genoma, as I was saying before. So what can early music especially do? Well, uh, it's this, trying to present not only concerts as entertainment, but trying to present a vision of, a vision of the world or, or a vision of art or a vision of society or, or uh, letting people understand there is something be beyond what is being played on what is being played of scene on scene, which is of course very important because at the end of the day it is a concert, but we have to bring all this world that is beneath the concert with, with it. Um, and you, the, the, the key point of the question actually uh, is not, uh, is the part about politics, because this is for the public, but it is also for the, for, for the people that are making decisions. In Italy, especially, um, 
the normal relationship with institution is we call you at the end of the year before to talk about the budget of the year after, then we wait for the answer, and then we speak again in December. And which, this is very bad. This is really very bad because uh, I think we really need to help our decision makers to understand all the ramification of ramifications of the choices. Um, not only to get the money for us, which is ultimately what every institution <laughs> wants to do, but also to understand that there are projects that can have added value on the medium term. So a chamber music concert can be a fantastic concert, can be an even more fantastic concert if you do it with a very promising young ensemble that will uh, benefit from it. It will be even more fruitful if this ensemble stays in your place two or three days, two years, and maybe interacts with schools. And it is even more uh, fruitful if it is done in a network, so that more people can profit of it, and the ensemble can profit of it, and we'll have a better ensemble next year. So uh, this is just an example, but uh, added value is one of the key words we have to think about and discuss with our decision makers. And uh, early music, because of what it is, uh, can be a fantastic tool to do this. Thank you, Julio. And Raquel Andueza, what do you think? Well, I agree totally with Julio, because I think it's, uh, well, I, that's what I also have in mind. Well, music, like uh, any other art, is uh, deeply vinculated to societies where it develops. Um, on one hand, it shows and interprets the reality where it comes from. But on the other hand, uh, due to the fact of uh, reflecting and interpreting it, it influences directly uh, on it and it contributes uh, to the evolution of this society. Um, so the period which um, covers early music has 10 centuries, it's a, it's a lot of years, from the old, old Middle Ages to the late Baroque, uh, so we, that makes it indis indispensable. Uh, it's an indis indispensable tool uh, to know and to understand the difficulties which uh, lead one to, uh, to another. Um, what I mean is that the inherited value uh, is undi undeniable. Um, and in this sense, it, had, it has to form a, a fundamental core idea in the cultural politics being developed in all contexts, as you said, Julio. Locally, nationally, of course, because it's evident that music helps to explain, to understand uh, the field where we are all born and the, and the music was born. And internationally as well, because from the Middle Ages till now, the relationships, uh, relationships among different societies have ended up building the world we know today. Um, and therefore the present where we live now uh, cannot stay apart from this knowledge of our own history. Um, so early music, well, all music, but early music that we are talking now uh, supplies this documentary evidence of the transfer from the, uh, how to say, feudal societies, feudal, so, so yeah, feudal, to all the ups and downs of the great empires. Um, so uh, I think that's the memory of who we are. Uh, it's a very spe spe special matter in this sense because with all this coronavirus crisis, we, it makes us aware of the need of getting together uh, far from nationalities, races, religions, just base, based on these few base, basic principles. Um, so, uh, as, and I agree that um, cultural politics cannot be um, dissociated to the educational ones. Uh, because, um, and they cannot be fixed just to the regular academic field, like music in schools, which have, you know, they have to be uh, compulsory, but also they have to extend to all citizens and to all contexts. Um, so I think the support that uh, politics have to give to early music has to be uh, complemented with this reinforcement. In where I think to be more aware how is also to understand it also can sound very vague to understand who we are 
and where we go to. I, I mean, we cannot understand who we are if we don't know our own history. So, um, and we need to know, and now we really need to know where we are going to. So I think uh, this heritage has, uh, has to be so, so important to, to, be, uh, to, to all the uh, po politicians now. To, uh, otherwise, we will not be able to overcome to this crisis. Thank you, Raquel. I think we missed some seconds, but I think the message was very clear uh, because of the connection. But now we connect to London with Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, I could give a very short answer because I agree exactly with Raquel and Julia as well. It could be a very one-sided panel. Um, but just to go back to, to the question, uh, it asks what role does early music to the sector play in relation to, to politics, to local national and international politics. And uh, I, I have a slight discomfort with this question. I think maybe this is colored by um, society and the, the, the current um, relationship with politics, which has been, uh, which has been perhaps tinged or colored over, over recent years. And, I like to think that uh, that music, creativity, and arts and culture could transcend politics. Um, that may be idealistic, um, but it's perhaps where we ought to try to be. And uh, Raquel was talking about music education, the importance of music education, um, the importance of access for everybody, um, and how music uh, and early music can can center yourself and can show you the route to where you come from and where you're going to. And I think by by allowing and enshrining this access to music um, at all levels, um, that, that provides society uh, with more stability, with more, with with greater awareness of itself and confidence in itself. Um, music is about identity, about self-discovery, about collaboration, about communication, so many things that we as human beings just inherently want to do and indeed find um, challenging at this current time particularly. So I think my answer would be that in many ways music shouldn't play a role in politics because it should be above it but that's an idealistic answer that i'm giving and perhaps we need to to play a very active role in order to get to the position where we don't need to play a role thank you richard that was very interesting now let's hear to albert edelman yeah i would i would go further even than richard and say that music has to has to play that role very forcefully as in show that the arts are not dependent on one political side or the other. It, it does go much deeper. Like Raquel says, it, it reflects your identity, especially early music. I mean, it's when the EU says we have to defend our European identity, which is a very scary thing and which was then scrapped from the commission's brief for um, uh, Maria Gabriel, who, by the way, is an excellent commissioner, but um, she, on her brief, was defend European identity, and then people said, eh, maybe not. Um, I'm sorry, but early music is is tragically right in the center of it, so why not? We, we should embrace it. We should um, show at, at all times that the arts are um, for everybody, not just for left, for right. We've seen in the Netherlands and in Belgium, for instance, that um, right-wing parties in power will say, oh, yeah, no, but that's a that's a leftist hobby that's a very dangerous dangerous thing so i don't think we uh we can let that happen and we have to show that we are there for everybody and we are because we all know that when we organize a concert half of the voters are not your flavor shall we say at least in belgium we know that um uh, half of our audience consists of people voting for the party who says the arts are not for them and they are so that's um odd um, and real and we have to appeal to the people in power that we're not playing that game as it were we're playing a different game um, one other thing that i think was uh, interesting in this question and that is less about politics but still very much about politics is um, showing that making music is a craft and if you can get people to not just come to a concert and think oh that was pretty but really appreciate the craft know the artist that makes sure that these people, if they have political power, they might use it in a useful way 
um, to, um, to, 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 to help strengthen the base for the arts in politics. Um, so I think there we have a very clear role uh, as artists, as organizers, to show that it's people are making the arts and other people come to listen. So it's a, it's a, joint, a joint venture, as it were. A bit strange as an answer, but I hope, I hope this, this helps a bit. Yes, that was very helpful. I don't know if Raquel, Richard, or Julio want to add something. Maybe you can just open your mic, or if not, yeah. Just, I mean, one thing, and Albert picked up on the on the uh, the concept of defending our culture, that was in the the uh, commission statements to begin with, and. Um, I always have a distinct difficulty with that phrase, defending. Uh, maybe it's the use of language or something, but you, we really should not be defending something. We should be celebrating and and developing. Uh, so just a comment. on. Thank you very much. Raquel, Ju Julio, I think you want to talk. Yeah, but on, it's, it's, it's a linguistic choice, of course, but it's a relevant one because uh, it's very used in Italy too. And I think we should really promote uh, a, a different vision of that. Because um, in this time of history, it's very easy to attract people with words like defend, fight, or, you know, rather than uh, create, uh, celebrate, uh, develop. But it is our duty to, to, to push in that direction because um, well, because it's important. I don't think this is just a mere linguistic choice. It is really a, a frame of mind in which, and what Albert said is very relevant too, because actually in Italy, uh, lots of our, lots of people of our public are voting uh, for left parties, which try to de-eliterize music and, and end up having difficulties with things like early music because they say it's for an elite. But it's weird because they should be. And on the other hand, uh, lots of our public, lots of people in our public don't like right-wing politics. And it ends up that sometimes right-wing politicians in Italy understand connection with the third wire more than leftists, and they end up to support it more, even if they don't really sometimes understand what we are doing. Uh, so it's tricky, it's really tricky. That's why I was saying that we should help our decision makers to understand what we and everyone actually is doing. Yeah, of course, but they have to be, you know, they have to have, they have to be open to be, to be helped. I mean, uh, because of course in, in Spain, there is also this thought that uh, early musical, classical music is elitist. Um, so they try to cancel it or avoid it or destroy it or, you know, like music has to be just fun, uh, funded by, by private sources, not public sources. So um, that's something that we really have to work on. Uh, but the thing is that we really should invite more politicians to our concerts because I think when they cross this line, the, and early music is a very good field for this because the music is not so complex in a way. Well, of, of, it depends on the, on the things you are performing. Of course, if you are playing some... Do some Gisualdo. Gisualdo, it's going to be complex, but you know, the harmonies, you know, it's uh, basically it's not such a... So, or oh yeah, are subtilior. Uh, but the music is not so complex in general. And that's why some, a lot of young people love early music because that's how I loved early music when I was a kid because I really felt connected with pop music. I could sing uh, some of these uh, ground basses. Uh, I could fi find them in pop songs. So uh, this, uh, I think we should take advantage of, of this. And uh, because I found politicians from right and left that suddenly they just become shocked by um, some songs or something, and they, be and they become more sensitive to it. I think it's our duty also to really, I think this confinement, you know, we spoke so much with everybody. We spoke so much, we, you know, all of these meetings we had, all these conferences and encounters and everything uh, with politicians, with uh, institutions. Um, I think we really have to take advantage of it and uh, and not cutting these this, uh, links that we have created among us. 
Thank you, Raquel. I think we can connect this uh, with the next question, uh, which will be the, the fourth one. Uh, and then Julio can uh, connect the, the answer. Uh, we are currently living a social and political crisis that affects countries and the concept of European identity. What is our place as institutions or artists in this context and what can we provide? Julio, please. <clears throat> Well, I, I was just going to comment that, uh, of course, politicians have to be open, but we need to be open too. Because uh, just very shortly, the first thing Pavia wanted to do after the lockdown, my town, was an early music concert with us. But it had to be open air, because it was not possible to do it. Uh, so we did it in the castle with a sound system, a very good one, but it was an, uh, uh, an amplification, it was necessary. Uh, but we lighted up the castle, uh, they gave us some extra found funds to do that. And we had La Compagnia del Madrigale, which is something which is really not to be sung in open air uh, and, 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 uh, and with amplification. But they, they, they joined us two days before, they rehearsed it with the service. And we did something about uh, Orlando Furioso, we worked, of course, on graphic presentation, you know, and all the, all the, all the, all the things added up to a sold out event with people crying for something they never heard before. And so, yes, they need to be open, but I think uh, our task will be to be uh, strict and, of course, uh, true to, our, to what we think about this music, but also open to share it in a different way, maybe. But this is a broader discussion. We are leaving it social and political crisis, yes, this is true. The concept of European identity, uh, as Albert was saying, we are, we are probably defending, stating that we have to defend something but that we don't really know what it is, but it's also something that we feel that is there. Because um, actually I cannot think about culture without thinking about dialogue you know music is culture culture is dialogue since ancient greek greece and why dialogue should be nation-based it should be at least european union but we should also connect broader so i think what we can do is what we are doing now on a on a uh, light scale like this uh, beautiful meeting which is very international but with few uh, attend this because it's for specialists, it's for early music ensembles that are selected, but we can go, you know, further, we can talk about this connection uh, with our public, with politicians, we can, we can tell the stories of our artists through our, our institutions, because every time we have an ensemble here, especially emerging ensembles, not e emerging ensembles, just, just emerging ensembles in general, uh, well, they are not national anymore they create around schools, they create around uh, places or occasions. So you have uh, a, a, a German-based uh, lute player with Japanese and French parents, and you have a Dutch player which is in his first year outside Holland, and you have an Italian player that studied always in Italy, but then French, Germany, and, and UK. And so their existence itself is a proof of the necessity and of the importance of, of, of dialogue. And that what they do is often very influenced by their history. We should just make this uh, dialogue and this humus evident to the public and to the politician and this, this is already something i think we should really start with very basic things like put in value what we have we we have a, a whole uh, bunch of stories that can be told and they just sometimes we just put them on stage good concert but we miss the opportunity to tell what is beyond this good con this good concert and i think this is a very basic thing that we can do and it works a lot. Thank you, Julio. Raquel, what do you think? Well, I totally agree. I totally agree with you, Julio, because um, I think the concept of nation and local 
uh, has to disappear in terms of music, of course, and also, uh, of course, uh, use it uh, for for the environment we have, we are working in. Um, and I was, as I was saying before, uh, we spoke a lot with politicians, with um, with audience, with institutions, with colleagues, more than ever. And, um, and we also got into the conclusion that we have the same problems. So I think what we really have to do is generate union in the own sector and, with, and also with other artistic disciplines uh, to be able to confront these new challenges, challenges that we have. Um, because I think it's being united, uh, but really united, like, uh, you know, as united as uh, multi-discipline sectors, I think it's the only way to to approach. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say fight, but I I'm, I will not say it because of Richard. So, to approach um, this crisis of the cultural sector um, because it's quite vulnerable. Uh, because at least in Spain, it's not considered essential for life. It's not one of, you know among the basic basic um, needs that human people need. Uh, but however, we could see during the confinement that everybody was consuming uh, um, and enjoying uh, culture, um, even if we were not aware of it, you know, people were uh, watching a Netflix series without knowing or, or being aware that this is culture because, you know, actors and actresses have been working. The music has been made by a composer, played by some players, players and singers. And I think um, politically we should really be aware that this is our our main tool that we are surrounded by by music by culture everywhere and we really um have to as institutions we and artists we have to value it and take advantage of this uh, during this crisis i think all crisis all this crisis is terrible but we really have to pull the good things um, the dialogues have been greater than ever. Um, the, you know, we've been locked uh, at home, but we have spoken and spoke. We, you know, we are using this. Um, we are talking everywhere. And as you say, Julio, we should not be just in the context of Europe. We should really get wider. But I think th this is our tool to to be united in all the different uh, sectors i think that's the only way we could uh, we could just be you know uh, approaching this new this new life that is coming now thank you richard well once again i i agree with everything that julia and raquel have said really i think um one of the crucial phrases that julio uh, expressed in his answer was about the importance of dialogue. Um, and that's what music brings and what our institutions and what our artists bring. Um, I'm talking to you here from the center of London, the heart of Brexit, um, you know, and one of the great tragedies of what's happened with this political um, issues in recent years is the loss of mobility. Um, one of the four central tenets of the European you know, Commission, European Union, is mobility of people, ideas, um, and communication. And this idea that restricting mobility is progression is is just just dreadful, really. And what we do as institutions um, is enable mobility. We bring artists, we bring ideas together, and in so doing, we create opportunity, we create hope, we create inspiration for people, hopefully, if there's that conflict, that, um, not conflict, that uh, conjunction of these ideas. Um, and therefore we move forward. We only have to look back to history. You know, when, when people don't meet other people, distrust gets, starts to develop. And when people do meet other people, we realize that actually we all have things to say to each other and we're all interested in talking to each other. So the concept of local, national, regional identity breaks down um, and we are human, we are humanity and we talk to each other and we share. So for me, 
what we can provide as institutions and what artists can bring to us is ideas coming together and a conjunction and that mobility is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Maybe Albert wants to say anything more. Uh, briefly, I interpret, I interpret the question maybe very practically. I was thinking about artists doing their homework. Um, Rema has been having a few very interesting online meetings with, with various specialists who for once did not have to be in the same space, just like today. Um, and we learned a lot from them. Uh, one speaker was Volker de Ude from Radial System. Um, and he, he stressed once more how important it is to know what decisions are made where and by whom. Um, now that the culture sector has basically come to a standstill, a lot of people were looking at Europe. Um, surely Europe will have lots of money. No, Europe does not have the money. The money comes from the from the nations, from, from all the countries. They decide culture politics. Uh, Volker then went on to say, um, lobbying, fantastic, um, but you can only do it locally. So if you are an ensemble, and you have a, a place that feels like home, make sure that everybody knows that that's your home. So be there, contact the city, the town, the whatever it is, uh, meet the people, um, do things for the town. It can be, uh, like I said earlier, just show them what the craft of music making is. Just do that in public and don't, don't pop out out of nowhere as a deus ex machina. Don't, don't just be the magical musician. No, be the musician who works and show how that works. And that is, I found a very interesting um, way of looking at lobbying. It's a very practical, not even a money kind of way. The money can come later, but you create a platform, you create a community around your own ensemble. And I think that if we speak to ensembles, that's a very interesting thing. Um, don't only be good, you have to be the best anyway. So don't come to the stage if you're not the best, but then you have to uh, make yourself relevant in different ways. And I think that's, um, yeah, that could be, that would be my answer to this to this question what is the uh, what can artists do is, is make themselves relevant that is great thank you albert and that drives us to the next uh, question which is more practical for the ensembles that, and the artists that we will um, watch this on youtube uh, today but maybe raquel julio or richard want to add something about yeah less practical, let's, let's say, more general. I don't see any, uh, <laughs> any more uh, things to say about that. So let's talk about the, the practical thing. So how do we convert it into actions? So for the ensembles or for the artists, musicians, not only musicians maybe, but everybody that is interested on using culture and art to give something to a society and to have additional value. How can our sector ensemble or other sectors, how can provide something more to our social and geographical context and the places where we perform? So Albert said already something about it, but maybe we can hear Raquel. Raquel. Okay, um, for me, you know, the, um, being, you know, I have my own group um, and now I'm running a festival. And so I, I can see things from different sides now. Um, but first of all, uh, for me uh, as a programmer, um, I try to use, uh, well, what I said before, um, that, they, that the ensemble should have in mind uh, all the things that we've been talking about, basically like the adaptation to the conceptual context of each festival. Uh, each festival has a environmental um, uh, context, um, a theme, you know, all the festivals now, they have all these themes uh, that we have to fit on them. Sometimes it's quite annoying, sometimes it's not so annoying, but you know, we have to, uh, you know, we have to follow these uh, patterns and, um, but also the context of uh, the conception of each festival, like, uh, 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 because I consider this social programming, like the programs, edu uh, educational projects, uh, or projects to, to which can be uh, fit also for elder people or for to go to associations for disabled people, um, projects who have like an equality, 
balance between the form and the content or um, a program who, which has um, not only a musical beauty but also something behind like um, you know the uh, female composers or um, I think and but for me the most important thing is to be honest uh, to the repertoire, even if you try to innovate and, um, you know, the respect of um, the respect of the sources that you are using. For me, it's, well, it's something basic that I, 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 I also followed with my own ensemble with La Granilla, the respect of the sources, even, even if you want to play a little bit around. But for me, um, to know, you know, sometimes we send proposals to any festival uh, but I think we have to focus in, like individually. What are you sending to, like, to whom? You know, I think it's something that you can, you can be more concrete and I think it works much better. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, well, I think this is um, it's an interesting question because it's about the, the role of the of the artist in society in, in in many ways and the role of the venue in in society and uh, Albert talked earlier about the two sides of the audience um, you know reflecting the two political sides perhaps but what we do know is we still have a relatively small um, percentage of the population who come and sit in concert halls um, and listen to concerts. And what we all want to do is to reach as widely as we can and to have that dialogue that we talked about earlier with as many people as possible so that you can get the range of perspectives and, and engagement from people. And so for me, uh, if artists or, or, or groups can really think about how they can offer things that go beyond the concert platform, um, offer ways of engaging with people. And it may be education work, it may be uh, engagement work, or it may be just in the way that they provide materials or even just in their, in their image, um, in, the, in, in the materials that you have on posters in the town that creates a buzz around something, it creates a conversation. Um, so, it's, so it's creating something special, creating a dialogue, creating as many levels of, of conversation and dialogue as you can. I think that's, that's what you can do in, um, to really make it relevant in the, in the context and the place where you are. Thank you, Richard. Albert? All right, click. Um, yeah, the, this question and perhaps the next question blend into each other a little bit. I was thinking about um, the last few years in Bruges, we have moved to quite socially aware themes like um, this season, uh, well, whatever happens in the season, we don't know. Um, but is it about biodiversity? Uh, we, we've had more things uh, like that community. Um, if that fits your ensemble's profile, um, it helps to just start the conversation. Um, I'm not sure that just good programs will go out of fashion. I don't think that's true. There will always be a need for just a good program. But I think many organizers are looking for, uh, you can call it added value, but that's maybe a bit of a, mm -hmm, a euphemism. Uh, but they are, they're looking for something extra. They want to, to play with, uh, with the artists. Like Richard said, they want to uh, use your skills as a communicator to, to add to their festival. And that's, that's the way it should be because you amplify each other in that, uh, in that sense. Um, so yeah, see, see where you can be relevant goes here as well. Check which festivals fit your profile. And I mean, you can, you can ask people to, to program you. That's not strange, um, but invest a little bit in, in finding them and addressing them in the, in the right way. Um, I also wrote down that quality, quality will always be the most important aspect because if you're not good enough, if you're not the best, don't show up. Um, but then that being famous in the media is not a very important aspect for me, at least. Um, I don't really care if you're famous or I do care if you're good looking, but it's not the main feature. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you, if you have something to say and that's, that, I mean, that should go for you anyway. If you have something to say, uh, you'll find a way to say it and, and you can enter the discussion with programmers to find the best way, basically. 
Can I just add to Albert's comment there? It's, it's not about added value, but it's about difference. It's about what what is unique about what you bring. It doesn't need to to say, you know, we do this, 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 but it's about why you're special, why, why you are the one. Um, that's all. What, what do you think, Julio? Well, actually, I think uh, not a lot has to be added uh, to what was said before. I, I, I was smiling while Raquel was speaking because we shared this experience of shaping programs uh, to themes. But I have to say that I totally agree. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it can be strange, but I, I actually have to say that uh, many of the big discoveries I made uh, for my ensemble, meaning not only pieces, pieces I, norm I normally propose uh, pieces to the, to the festivals, but uh, what, you know, looking into what I can do, what my ensemble can do. Uh, have you ever thought of doing that? Why don't you do this, author, this composer? Why don't you do this repertoire? Well, most of this, many of these things I discovered from very good programmers that saw from outside possibilities in, in me and my ensembles, which I didn't really trust from inside. And there are, especially in one case, that's a big part of what I'm doing now that was actually a programmer's idea. So uh, I think this, this thing of being really connected with the uh, programmers is very important because uh, you don't have, you can't have a dossier anymore and send it as a mailing list as old style agents did. Uh, we need to study uh, the, the programmers. We need to, and speaking as a conductor now, but I mean, uh, we need to study the, 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 the programmers. We need to, to be engaged with them. We need to understand what they seek for a very simple reason. We are all on the same boat. I mean, it's not as we used to think like 25 years ago when I was a kid. Programmers are on one side and we are on the other side and we have to convince them. Yes, of course, we have to convince programmers and we as programmers need to be convinced. But how are we convinced? Uh, we are convinced if, if we feel that what is proposed is a real partnership, a, 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 a response to a, to a cultural um, project, which is also, we can be also, which can be also a proposal about adding something to, to, a, to a cultural project that you see in the programmers. Hey, I see you're doing this and this is great. Have you, have you thought about this ramification of your idea? So I think we have to be true to ourselves. We sometimes have to admit that we just don't have so much to add to the discussion. And so maybe I will tell you we have a very good program because I agree with that, that very good programs will always be needed, but we have just for, we should be true to ourselves and admit candidly that no, I can't force what I do into your skin this year. But maybe on other ideas, we can say, no, listen, here, I really think we have something to say and not be afraid to say it if it is really you. So I think we, we need to, to understand that programmers and ensembles and artists are really in the same frame of action and we need to build, um, I mean, partnerships. We are not, we don't think that we have to sell or buy concerts. We have to create networks around ideas and not being afraid of being true to ourselves because it's, it's as it is. Every one of us is who he is. I can say a lot on, on some things. I can say pretty much nothing on others. I can ask a programmer well, this is what I do. I like what you're doing, but I don't really see if I can be a part of it to have ideas because sometimes good programmers will give you impressive ideas. And uh, well, that's it. I, 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 since I joined REMA in 2010 with Gizdieri, I learned an awful lot about music making, about music programming, about, and again, through dialogue, through network through diversity. So I think we just have to be open to learn one from each other and not being afraid of who we are and not being desperate if this time I cannot fit in the program. Maybe the program will give me ideas to do something different next year. But, you know, we need to think more 
long term and not just to even if I understand and then I'm closing but even if I, even if I understand that in this particular moment we are all very worried of our concert next month because we don't have so many concerts actually we can't program concerts as programmers we can't play or sing concerts but still we need to remember that we need to build for the future in a, in a, in a longer and maybe take this incredible occasion not just to try to get back to a comfort zone which was not really comfortable before but try to create a new normality after this crisis and not just to try to get back to uh, what it was before i think it was very long i'm very sorry albert is used to that he's smiling <laughs> actually i wanted to say something i think it happens that Julia speaks a long time, but that's good. Um, <laughs> beautiful things. Um, no, I, was, I would just put on the table that um, the, the organizer is the gateway to the audience. That is a sort of a position of power where you can say you have to do what I want because I know the audience, but it's also a responsibility. Um, something that you see in the largest halls sometimes or in um in some festivals where people fill their program by buying things uh, and because it's a prestigious festival or because the names are super famous the audience will come but i think it's uh, we we have seen this and we see it among our, our rema members especially because none of us are in a position of unlimited funds just buying all the famous people and let that be the festival we are in the business of a partnership, a creative partnership with the artist, and then sell that to the audience. And the selling is where our job is, basically. Um, and it's it's a very uh, yeah, it's a very fulfilling relationship, I would say too. So this triangle between artists, organizer, and audience is is where the fun happens. So um, get in there. Yeah, of course. I am sorry. I interrupt. Um, I I agree so much what you all said. Uh, I think. You know, Albert, not all programmers are like you. And we, you know, sometimes it's very easy to go to the fame for the famous names. So you you, you can relax and, and then suddenly you, sometimes I, I can see some posts on Twitter or Instagram or that we all as, as ensembles, now I'm talking, uh, we make so much publicity to the organizers. I mean, that we really make an effort as an artist, as artists to, promote the concerts, which is good, but of course is the job also to the organizers. And now I'm talking as an organizer, it's our duty to promote the concerts in the right way, to believe in the projects. So that's, that's so important. And also as our, um, Julia was saying something which is so important, that is that if you don't believe in the project you have been asked for, don't do it. You know, I have this experience of doing some projects with uh, some uh, orchestras or, and I didn't like the music so much or, and I did my, the best I could or anything, some recordings that I really the, the, think that they are nice, but they didn't, you know, they didn't go so far. And suddenly I record as this city of uh, Spanish music from the 17th century, which is all anonymous and all this. And you, you think, oh my God, this is not going to work, but I just do it because I like it. And suddenly we receive these awards and we have so much, so many concerts. And, but if you believe in your project, it will succeed. That's something that I learned from my own experience. And if you believe that this project is not going to be good for you, just because the festival is asking you for this, then don't do it. Don't do it, please. Don't do it because it will not help you. It will not help you. And if you believe as you know, Albert just asked me for a concert like devoted to birds, which I never thought of doing this, you know, for next season. But then I just made this program and then I thought, oh my God, this is working. Then, then I just said yes. Otherwise I would have said no. And I, I think this is super important. And I'm gonna shut up. You could, we could be listening to you for, for hours, Raquel, but we also could be listening for hours to Julio, actually for three minutes <laughs> to Julio. No, just to say that also don't be afraid of uh, strong requests, because sometimes I just did something like that two weeks ago. Uh, there's a symphonic institution in Italy who is having my ensemble because they are opening to Baroque. 
it's a broader scheme and they want to also to have some so they said we have no money because there's COVID. it says it has to be your thing so 18th century it has to be polyphony but we have to send it to the public it has to be research but we need people that love tchaikovsky to come to see it and and it has to be 50 minutes and you have to count in you speaking about the program and that's dangerous you know uh, so because because it has to be engaging and i said what the hell am i going to to to, to do with this and this also was for not so much money so we will go you know to zero but really very so no i need an extra soprano no i can't okay so at the end of three days of work it turns out to be a very balanced and nice program with a bit of christmas in it but not too much so it can be adapted to other things so actually out of this very strong request from the promoter i i i, I have a short sexy nice program cheap with my best singers and with some research and some famous items and you know thanks to the promoters so really don't be afraid of tough requests they can be very interesting thank you i think uh our time is done but maybe uh just to to finish uh this nice talk we can uh answer very briefly um with all the things that we, we said today, uh, just to speak to the ensembles that are watching and we'll ask to you uh, in just in five or six minutes, maybe um, you can give them ideas, concrete ideas or not concrete, inspirational ideas, because I think Richard said something interesting, uh, which is co very connected with our festival. And that's what I want to bring it here. Uh, they have to be unique and they have to be connected with each festival, with this, which is it, it, each territory, which is also very important for us in, in Sierra Spugna. So maybe you can just uh, inspire them before they inspire you. And the first one is Richard, actually. And this is the question about what we're looking for, yes, and, and, and how we do that. And I, I can answer it quite, quite short, I think. I mean, what, it goes back to Albert's point and many people have said about don't bother unless you're the best uh, at what you're doing and then then the other things are important so we're looking for integrity um, and we're looking for the story what is it what is your story um, it's no good just sending uh, a, a proposal which has got a list of Telemann bark and handle repertoire on you know, we've, we've seen that for 20 years um, it's why why do you connect to that um, and why is that going to be relevant? And that will come through. If you've got a connection, that will come through. So it's it's the integrity of your story that is important. Thank you very much, Richard. Albert Edelman. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, same, I would say. Um, be communicative about what you are, wh why you do it. Um, I mean, if you if you do if you are the best at playing those Telemann pieces, that's that's great and that that works that works too. Um, help help me sell you in a way, um, yeah, and and show maybe your 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 range of what you can do. But also, don't be like a menu in a bad restaurant that has all the dishes. So you're probably good at a few things. Make sure that I get that. Make sure that I get what what your specialty, your passion. I mean, it's about your passion. And then later, if you have a relationship, you can experience the things uh, like, like Julio said, um, from that creative relationship builds something else. Um, but that's a work of years. So you have to, if you're starting out, you, you will have to do, um, you will have to focus more and, and sell yourself in, uh, in that way. Thank you, Albert and Julio Brandi. Well, yes, well, well, well that's it, actually. Uh, we, we always seek authenticity and, and, uh, and something which is uh, honest and, and properly delivered. So I think you, uh, as everybody said, well, you have to be the best in something. Uh, there's nothing bad at all just saying where you start and, when you, and where you end. You can't be able to do everything. Actually, on the other hand, what you are can be very special and you have to present it very 
very honestly, because you can be very good at playing Telemann. And you, and you can convince, I think, Albert to buy a whole concert of Telemann Trio Sonatas, if it is fantastic. I've but you it. don't have to assume that it is fantastic and you are fantastic. You, have, you, do, you don't have to defend yourself at all. You just have to share your vision and your story and your passion and your, and your message. Because if you have been doing this for quite a while, and you, you will have, because if you, if you are on the market, you, you, you ought to have done it for, for, for some years, you will have to have a vision on that. Don't be afraid of making it grow and change because the tours can be done if they make sense, if they help you have a different vision on what you do. Uh, but let it grow and explain it without any fear because you look at other artists as postcards. Other artists, other ensembles are postcards. They are pictures of excellency and success and good management and everything. And yourself, no, you know your stories, so you know all your problems. But you know what? Placido Domingo fought his own life against high notes because he just didn't have them. But he fought all life in a very clever and intelligent way. And at the end, and the end, and the end of, the, of his career, everyone remembered his voice, which is not really the thing he had. You see? So you see yourself as the whole. Well, he had a great voice, of course, but there were easier voices. He had to manage his voice. So you see, you see yourself as your whole, and you see all the process, and you see other ensembles and artists as postcards. Don't do that mistake. Don't try to look like those postcards. Just try to evolve and show yourself as what you are. And, you know, it's, it's difficult because maybe if you did another repertoire, you would have done 45 concerts instead of 20. Well, that's life. You are what you are. Uh, the way to do 45 concerts and not 20 is not changing the repertoire, is growing what you are and making programmers understand it. Because if they don't understand it, they can't sell it. And if it is something worth of attention, they will, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but ultimately they will understand it. So just be yourself and explain it with all your mind and heart. Thank you, Julia. That was very beautiful. We have here four uh, ensembles from. I want to say name. something. I want to say something. I didn't. No, an introduction to you. It was a nice introduction for the president of the Spanish Association of Early Music Ensembles. So Raquel Andrea has a lot to say to them directly. So please, Raquel, it's your time. Sorry, <laughs> I thought you were going to the following question. I, I was last this time. Um, no, I just want to agree with the, uh, you three because it's uh, all it has been said. I just wanted to say that being the best doesn't mean to be technically perfect. It means such a huge range of different things. I mean, um, but for me, the honesty is the first one. If you are honest with your instrument, you with your voice, uh, then everything will be fine. Be humble. Uh, don't take things for granted. Experiment, and of course, you will have to. At the beginning, I was also doing um, different repertoires, but at the end, just I knew that I just loved Italian music from the first half of the 17th century, and Spanish music from the 17th century. This is my my fetish. I, uh, so I really had to. I decided to focus on it. Uh, but of course, you have to experiment and to be open to learn because everything will guide you to be better in, in your own specific, specific field. Um, and also, what, um, what else? Uh, yeah, don't, be, don't try to be perfect technically because perfection can be boring uh, in a way. And um, just be widely perfect. I mean, uh, with your honesty, with the communication, if... Uh, try to sing with your instrument, try to play and sing and uh, uh, recite your text in the most honest way and work as a team always. Don't try to impose uh, your own and don't be individual. You know, when you play in an ensemble, it's like a football team, you have to play as a team. 
your hearts have to beat, beat together. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. Be surrounded by people you like. It's also a very good thing because uh, sometimes, you know, you work with different orchestras and you just dislike this violin player or you this can double play bass. No, double bass are normally cool. Um, but um, <laughs> so you just form your own ensemble with people you like. Experiment and uh, and just be honest. For me, this is uh, this was my key, for example, just to be honest. I, I'm not perfect at all. Um, and I, I don't try to be, but I try to be as honest as possible and it worked. So that's, that's the only thing I could say. Bravo. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, our um, digital manager can invite the rest of the ensembles to, to join the, the, the ensembles. And I want to thank you very much, uh, Albert, Raquel, Richard and Julio for this very, very interesting um, uh, talk. Not, I think not only for the four ensembles, but for everybody that will w watch it. And also uh, for, for the programmers that, that will get uh, involved in, and inspired by what you say. So thank you. Um, and while Julia is invited the ensembles to, to join, uh, I don't know if Richard or Albert want to add more or I can present also the ensembles before they, they have some questions, at least two, to, be, to make uh, even more practical or to get some instructions of how to, how to make it real. Uh, they are already coming. Uh, but Richard, Albert, do you want to add something? There's a lot said already, Albert. No, I would say let's let's go to the questions of the of the so far silent listeners. Um, I'm curious. Thank you very much. Um, well, I Laura Alvarado from Ars Humana. And it's a group based in Basel. And uh, do you want to? Do you have a question for the awesome, for the speakers? Uh, well, yes, um, it has been uh, already answered, but I think I perhaps need a more concrete answer to this one. In is that that uh, taking what Albert said that when you are based locally and you find a place to be your home, that you need to start working locally. But what happened when locally there's so much, like in Basel? There are a lot, and you said you have to be the best, but of course to be the best in Basel, what, what means to be the best? Because for me, almost everyone is the best at something. So how do you find your place against more established groups? That would be my, answer, my question. Uh, yeah, but the exceptions have to be made in Basel, Amsterdam, The Hague. Um, there's a few. Don't go to a place where there's a, a large school. That's a terrible idea. Um, but it's a, it's a great idea to go there, and then you need to move. Um, the well, the point came from from Folkert, who runs a very small festival in uh, in rural Germany, um, and he does the work with the community. So he is there. Uh, inviting artists, getting them in touch with the local people um, and, and making something. I'm also thinking about the system in France where there's, this is for larger ensembles, but where you can be an artist in residence in a region and there's this fight over who gets to have the post of the, art, the orchestra in residence. Um, not the fairest way to distribute money, but a very clever way to, to be somewhere to really be local to do the things to go into the schools to uh like raquel said meet meet well have social social programs um and you can do it yourself i mean outside of basel there's tons of mountains with villages with little churches you can be that um just as a as an idea um but of course it's it's secondary to your quality and that you're in a in a region where there's too much going on, maybe. So that's that's the risk. So I, I basically have no answer for you. How how useless. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe Raquel. Can I speak? Oh, sorry, Richard. No, no, no. Raquel, you first. Um, for me, I think of course you have to knock at every door you can, small ones, small ones, and go to all these uh, emerging programs like EAP. Uh, you know, just apply for them. EAP, uh, Emerging, all these uh, pro projects where um, young ensembles can be broadcasted more uh, wider and 
can be promoted, sorry, not broadcasted, promoted. And um, also, um, I think you have to find your identity. Uh, we, we see this also in pop music that we imitate everybody. You know, there is a style that everybody imitates. And I think we have to, of course, you have to be inspired by someone. I was getting inspired by, by other singers when I was 16, 18. But of course, you have to find your own identity. Otherwise, you will never be unique. You will never, I think you are playing. You have to find your own identity as an, as an ensemble. You have to find your own sound. Otherwise, you know, like we can have imitators of uh, different groups. But uh, like um, people who play like a very um, exciting way, like as, um, what was the name of this ensemble, of Italian ensemble? Um, ah, I don't remember, like, uh, I don't know, the concerto Italian? No, concerto Italian, no. Like they, they play very, you know, vigorously. Or arpeggiata, that everybody can try to imitate these kind of mixed sounds. Or I think you have to find your own identity. Otherwise, we will be copies. And we cannot be, you know, we, we will not find our own space if we are, if we copy or imitate. And I can see this a bit too often now. So I think it's a, something you have to also to focus in your own essence. And I'm sort of going to repeat a little bit what you said, but put it in a different way. We said earlier about how being the best doesn't necessarily mean being technically the best. And to pick up uh, Raquel's point from the previous question, it's about your honesty, or my, my point is about your integrity. So um, it's when we say be the best, it's being truest to yourself, actually, finding finding what the story you can tell. And actually, you can do that in London or Amsterdam or Hague or Basel, because nobody else can tell your story. So So just have faith in yourself. Julio, I think you wanted to add something. Good, thank you. We have another question from David Gutierrez from Preteito Imperfecto. David, uh, you have to open up the, the microphone. No, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so our question is about, because you, you were talking about institution and, and the, importance of, the importance of them, but uh, my question is, what is in, in your opinion the, the best way to, con to, to contact uh, them in effective manner uh, from a young assembly like like us. Yeah, the, the way to contact, we don't know your opinion. So I will give it to Julio, which was the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, how can this message of of the ensemble awesome uh, approach the programmers? Well, that's of course very difficult because um, you have to know that programmers' life is not very easy. Uh, when you see Albert, you see a fantastic programmer in a fantastic venue. And as I said about Placido Domingo before, you think that he's in a fantastic position and he can do things. And of course he is, but it's just so very tough and difficult to do it properly. And time is a terrible factor in this because we are all overcrowded with work, uh, especially, you know, because in smaller venues, it can happen like me or Raquel, that, that, that the artistic director is a musician himself. Uh, in bigger venues, it's less, uh, it's less the case, but then bigger venues have bigger, you know, uh, fishes to fry in a, in a way. So time is always, uh, is always, uh, a problem. So first thing you have to know, I think, is that if you don't get a reply, it is not a no. You know, sometimes uh, you just lose emails and messages because, because you, you're just overcrowded. So you don't have to assume that an absence of reply means a lack of interest. This is, this is absolutely not the case. On the other hand, you cannot be stalkers. And of course, it's, it's very important, as I said, um, to uh, personalize the message. I, I laughed a, a lot when I saw once Albert giving a, a session in a, in a panel saying, well, start from writing correctly the name of the programmer you are, you are writing to. And I mean, that, that's, that's, actually, that's actually something. I mean, it's right. Just, just, just make sure that you are writing to someone. Be in contact and be, be, be trying to be in contact with him and or her and with what 
I mean, think if Raquel receives for Estella an offer for a, a Messiah with 95 performers. Well, yeah, I think she loves that. But it's just not what she's trying to do with the Camino de Santiago. And they, cannot do it. they cannot do it. <laughs> exactly. Or just the uh, Rachel written as it is in, in French, you know. It's, it's not working. I think it's easier if you meet people. How do you meet people? Well, that's difficult. Uh, you can go to concerts. You can, uh, you can try to be in networks. You can... Uh, you have to be polite, you have to be respectful, but you have also have to know that basically programmers are curious and open for new things. And they have to balance this in their, in their everyday life. So it's very tough. But I think the three golden rules are right to the people, each one of them, and don't do mailing lists. Take time thinking about what can fit programs don't be afraid of asking questions while you do that. Be brief. Send short emails with attachments. You know, ideas with details in attachment. Don't write very, very long things that will be easily lost. And, you know, don't be afraid of contacting people even personally, but remember that uh, you know, we have to be respectful and we have to respect uh, the nays even more than the yay, because the yay is, okay, it worked. The nay can be, can make you understand why you will have more yays in the years after. It's tough. It's very tough, but don't be discouraged. And really the main, most important thing is an absence of reply is not a lack of interest. Don't lose faith in yourself because you don't get replies. It's just, it can just be the way you present it. It can just be the wrong moment. Don't ask for a concert in Concert Cabao Bruges uh, in July for next March because, you know, it won't work. We, they program, you know, try to understand the time frames. Some festivals program on longer terms, some festivals on shorter term. I mean, knowledge is the key. And I think Albert has something to say. Oh, it's, it's very brief. But you, you send something to someone that is your, your attempt to contact you, to contact me or someone else. Um, but you can also be found. And I think it's very important that you can be found, that what you present in that place represents who you are, uh, what you want. Um, I have booked people from a Facebook video. This, this has happened. Um, so if you have something good, um, use that. Um, if you, for instance, um, if you have only recording from a church with bad light and a little bit not great sound, um, see if you can invest in a good video. Um, it helps to do these emerging e app all these kinds of things. Often they come with a recording. Uh, you get something useful out of it. Um, at least that's that's the ideal of the organizer that you um, that you have something to uh, to market. We'll we'll need it too, of course. The the good material. So uh, I would just add that, Richard. Yeah, just a very short thing, and this won't work for everybody or in all circumstances, and you have to use it um, with discretion. But those of you who have been to Basel or The Hague or whatever. Um, if I get an email from um, certain people, I'm going to read it more quickly than others. And what I'm saying here, you know, I've had in this kind of Stephen Layton has recommended artists to me occasionally. Um, and then I'll read it and I'll look at who it is. Uh, I was you know, last week we had an interview, John Eric Gardner was here doing an interview. If somebody like that tells me, oh, have you seen this young group? then I'll look at it. So if you do have the ear of anybody with influence, um, um, obviously, as Julia says, you have to be polite, you have to be um, uh, use discretion. But if somebody will, have, will be an ambassador for you, then that's going to help to open those doors. Just bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, 
it's so interesting, I think, for everybody. Um, and we have Moises Maroto from Serendipia, which is one of the ensembles that, that has been recording a video clip for the for the Echoes Digital, our concert that is running uh, last weekend and next weekend. You can watch it on TV if you want on the YouTube. On the on Facebook and also actually on the TV, but only the local one and Allegro HD. But now Moises uh, from Serendipia wanted to say some words. Okay, thanks. Uh, listen, yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for all. It's not a question, but it's only for to to be grateful with uh, your words. It's very useful uh, all the thing that uh, you say and. Okay, Albert, thank you. Richard, thank you. Raquel, thank you. And Julio, thank you. And of course, uh, Jorge for organizing that. Uh, thank you a lot. It's a pleasure for for me, and I think that for all of us to be to be here um, to listen that uh, useful things. Uh, only that. Thank you for all. Thank you also, Moises, Laura, Lydia, and David for being here, and, uh, and well, also all the people that is watching this. Um, we are a bit out of time, but we have a very, very interesting, interesting and concrete uh, question from Lydia from Ibera Auri. So let's listen to it and answer, answer the question, please, Lydia. Ibera Auri was one of the ensembles that were also selected with Ars Humana and Anacronia, which will be tomorrow at the, at the uh, Echos Lab, um, was one of the ensembles that were selected for the Presence Echos Lab. Uh, and now they have a microphone. Hello. <laughs> we are an ensemble that delves into specific characters and their stories around music, as it is Marisa Palos or René Pignon. Uh, which marketing uh, tools could be implemented in order to generate attraction around a specific historical character and their stories? That's the question. So we're talking about marketing and the proposal of Ibera Audi. Uh, and Julio Brandi will be the first to talk. I lost totally. I, I, I didn't hear the question, sorry. There was a buzz in my connection. Oh, maybe you can read it again and I will write in the chat, but read it slowly. Well, it was slow already, but just that people No, can... no it was an electronic problem, a signal okay. problem. I... Thank you, Lydia. Can you do it again? Yes. Uh, we are an ensemble um, that delves into specific characters and their stories around music, as um, Marie Zappalos in Spain uh, or René Pignon. Uh, which marketing tools could be implemented in order in order to generate attraction around specific historical character and uh, their stories? So uh, now you have to answer, Julia. Well, I, I think uh, quite a few things are already mentioned. Um, you have a story to tell, um, so you have a. You have a thing, that's good, a thing is good. Um, make sure people understand um, your thing and then because it's quite specific, you have to be on the lookout for just the right festival where it can fit. This seems to me like for many small festivals, it's good to have um, this very concrete story because it looks good in a brochure. It can be part of a larger story. If someone has a Paris focus, for instance, you can, you can put the Pignon program in there. Um, it will be harder for large concert halls because they will have to sell something that is a little bit obscure and then done by an ensemble that is probably not known. But you can still uh, develop a relationship with those people um, and, and maybe go towards that. But um, I think if you have something so specific to sell, you can you can go to the smaller festivals and see see how that works. And of course, make sure everything that you present online reflects exactly how you want it to be. And if I could just, sorry, add something there. I think as you have a story and you have a narrative from an individual, really use the voice of that character as well in how you how you communicate. So oh, it's a conceit, but almost approach people as if you are that 17th century, 18th century character. That's what I was going to say. I know your ensemble and um, I know the aesthetics that you present. 
and I think you, this, uh, that fits very well in what in this project. I mean, they Ibera Auri they they um, really recreate even with the dresses and everything. They try to achieve this kind of. Um, not it's not all the aesthetics because they don't dress as a baroque uh, people but they have this kind of um uh at uh how do you say um with no uh, with no time a temporary uh how do you say it a temporal this uh, kind of frame um and i think you can use this and of course the fact of that you are presenting two women is also something that is is good, you know, for f selling to festivals. I think it's something that uh, is good. I think you have to focus on that. And as Richard was saying, like, uh, re you have to recreate these two women uh, in your concept and in your aesthetics as, as you are doing it, but explore it and don't be afraid of this. And of course, as Albert says, is probably something for small, you know, your group is also, um, uh, it's not very large. So um, I think you have to go for the small festivals, but I think it's something that it can be very interesting because it's also into this uh, frame of uh, rescuing um, uh, women and uh, performers and composers and painters and singers. And I think it's something that is, it can really work for you. So I'm happy that you are doing this. And sorry, don't forget, I think always this double layer between what Richard and Raquel said, uh, speak with their voices. But uh, early music is always about giving, voice, giving, giving a voice today to something that was before. Everything we do has a meaning today, which is related to the meaning it had in, 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 the, in the old days. And so we have to, to, to always uh, I'm working, I'm on my way. I mean, with my ensemble, we do sacred music. So it's something that can seem very far, but actually it can speak very loud, not only on a sacred uh, point of view, but also on a general spiritual point of view. It talks about life, it talks about men, about repenting, about guilt, about uh, redemption. And I'm still on the way. I'm not doing this, actually. I should take part in this workshop from the other side. But uh, what, what you do, was something in its time and is something today. So always speak with their voices, but try to understand where are these people now and what they are telling to us. Telling to us. I think this is very important because, uh, and you can do that being very true to the sources and very true to the, to the, to the original aesthetics, but talking to today people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Albert and Raquel, Richard and Julio, and also to the ensembles that has been here. It's nice to share uh, uh, between all the pers perspectives. And, and I will, before saying goodbye, first I want to thank, uh, of course, the University of Murcia and the Acción Cultural Española and also La Mancomunidad de Serras Puña, the councils of Aledo, Alama, Totana, Pliego, Mula y Librilla, to, for making it possible and for connecting on these times of disconnection to connect us and to make it possible and to the speakers to accept to be here uh, wherever you are but to be connected on this uh, talk. I would love to hear just a last sentence or a, a last um, goodbye sentence or a feedback from each of you, from all the four speakers. So please, Albert Edelman, uh, you are the first. Last, famous last words. Um, now I was still thinking a little bit about uh, how to get to, um, how to link between the artists and, um, and the organizer. And, and one thing that is, that is always key for me is, is help, help each other, help us to know what you will offer the audience that is that's where the triangle again comes in um and and yeah make make that the most meaningful it can be thank you julio brandi with the microphone please sorry 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 no i have to say i i uh i talked before about learning well i learned a lot from this conversation from my very esteemed colleagues and from you, from your questions. So just don't forget to learn from every occasion in, in your life. Have faith. It is a difficult time to have faith. We are, we are all very 
worried. We are maybe scared also for our life, but don't lose faith. Question yourself uh, and uh, look to the future because if culture and our education has given us something, it has to be uh, a vision to, 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 to go towards our future with, with ideas and not with fear. So have faith in yourself, grow, up, grow uh, engage your musicians, engage your audiences, engage your, yeah, the, the, the concert venues, the festivals, and uh, you know, you will be the early music of tomorrow and I can't wait to hear what, what you will show us. Thank you, Giulio. Raquel? Oh, that was beautiful, Giulio. Um, yeah, not so much to say that, um, yeah, don't forget that we are all on the same boat, as Giulio said before. Uh, organizers, politicians, we are, we are all working on the same uh, music field, so we need each other. So don't, don't think that you are bothering anybody, just asking questions or sending projects and be honest, be yourselves. And uh, we all need us. I mean, we need you, you need us, we need us. So don't forget this. And um, it's, I have to say that it's so nice that there is such a bunch of early music groups now that are growing and uh, doing it so well. So I, I'm just very happy that this uh, early music thing in Spain is growing and growing and uh, let's continue doing this, you know, and enjoy what you do. Never, never, you know, never, don't fight, just enjoy. Thank you, Raquel. Richard. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, firstly, thank you for listening. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. And the thing I've taken out of it, I think, which I would pass on is, is, is the thing about integrity and being true to yourself. Um, it's a natural thing for people to do, to imitate, but actually tribute bands only go so far. And if you really want to um, make your mark as artists have the honesty and the confidence to believe in what you're doing and that will communicate um, and you'll create a dialogue so good luck thank you and good luck to everybody that is watching and to the speakers to the ensembles to the audience from our ecos digital you can follow us the rest of the days every day at seven o'clock spanish time um uh, well it has been a pleasure to have you here um, and we hope next year in our fifth edition we will meet personally we will have ensembles playing alive and we have we will have you to speak and to continue this very very interesting uh, topic about what can early music do for the society or for the rest of the, of the world thank you and see you tomorrow goodbye <laughs>